inner webinar series. You will likely see us at trade shows and events and other webinars like this where we are helping clients navigate the complexity of today's talent-scarce environment. And we are happy to introduce you to the Unleash Your Total Workforce to Win a Competitive Advantage workshop. So without further ado, we're going to bring you up to speed on what we'll cover today, and I'll introduce our esteemed presenter. So, Samantha, thank you for advancing the slide. So ultimately here, what we want to impart to you is that if we look back at just three years ago, 2016, when we did our talent trends research, over half of human capital leaders we surveyed in that research said that their strategic goal was to make a measurable impact on business performance. And there was less of a link to talent strategies to actual business growth. And what we're seeing now, just three years later, is that there is absolutely the mission of talent leaders, two of whom are on the webinar today, and that 87% are saying that, holy cow, this is such a critical business imperative. I've got to measure the impact. And as our chief people officer, Cindy, says, well, what are the rest of the folks saying? Where are they doing? Because aren't we all accountable for measuring that impact? So ultimately, with the competitive pressures, the quick evolution of the talent-scarce environment, we're finding that the workforce has to be quickly adapted, that we have to look at the total workforce, as it were, to really be competitive, and that your C-suite, including your CEO, CFO, COOs, are looking for talent advisors to be more than just that, to provide clear direction and advice as to how the organizations you represent can move the business forward. So ultimately, we're happy to introduce our speakers today. We're going to take you through what it is that will set the stage for our discussions and really to lay the groundwork um, for this talent trends uh, talent navigator series, as we call it, we wanted just to quickly highlight the human capital research that both of our speakers will directly speak to. And to give you a sense for who was involved in this research, conducted by a third-party firm out of the Silicon Valley, um, there were 800 human capital leaders and C-suite professionals who participated. And this year, for the first time, working professionals 1,700 across the globe, and the 17 countries you could see highlighted there on the slide, and in key industries among automotive and manufacturing, banking and financial services, consumer goods, life sciences and healthcare, and IT and tech. So the insights that our speakers will speak to um, will certainly draw upon the insights that came from the research, and then ultimately, as talent advisors and professionals themselves, what they're specifically seeing in the market. So let's go to the next slide. So I'm really pleased to introduce, firstly, Kelly Jones, who is the global leader and senior talent acquisition director at Cisco. And Kelly is a leader focused on connecting amazing people with Cisco for the global sales and marketing organization. She's an experienced driver of change who's particularly passionate about the role people play in organizational transformation. Kelly has a very deep, deep experience building and leading global teams focused on developing data-driven creative solutions to enable business transformation, which I think is so critical to our discussions today. And Kelly joined Cisco a little over 10 years ago, and the TA organization has worked across multiple HR ecosystems in a varied number of roles within the organization. So welcome, Kelly. So glad to have you with us here today. And then I'd like to Thank introduce you. the Chief People Officer here at Ron Fed Source Right, my colleague Cindy Keveney. And Cindy is a leading business and human capital executive with more than 30 years of experience transforming organizations by building high-performing teams to produce profitable growth, to develop industry-leading products, and certainly to create corporate strategies and complex, and in today's world, very quickly changing environments. And Cindy heads up our global HR function. 
Um, I'm joining you here today from the home office in the Panhandle of Florida. Kelly is in the offices in downtown Denver, Colorado. Uh, she mentioned she's overlooking Rocky Stadium, so that's really neat. And then Sydney, I believe, is in her home office today in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So, so pleased to have you both here today. Thank you again. And uh, I'm really pleased that the topic today, uh, for those of you who are joining us um, from various parts across the globe, listening in, I want to advise that we are absolutely going to make every effort to include time at the end to take your questions. And we'll also um, be sending along the recorded session of this particular webinar, as well as one that was conducted earlier for our colleagues and those based in Asia Pac and EMEA. Um, so you'll get to hear both of those sessions. So, um, Cindy, I think I'm going to turn things over to you to take us through introduction of the talent trends. And thank you again. Thanks so much, Tracy and Kelly. I'm really excited to be doing this with you. So welcome, and thanks so much for, for joining us. So before we delve into our t 10 talent trends um, that are depicted here with a little person running because it is uh, <laughs> depicting a, the, the pace at which we're facing a tremendous change. So I'd love, before we dive into these, Kelly, um, to get your perspective on transformational change and the leadership that's required as our talent acquisition and talent functions and organizations face the incredible amount of change. So talk a little bit about transformational leadership and how it kind of impacts your day to day. Yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, series. It's a topic that I'm very passionate about and I, I love to talk about, so I appreciate the invite. Um, to the topic of leadership and transformational change, if you think about any time you're trying to drive a strategy, um, having the right people at the helm is critical to ensuring that that happens. And so when we think about leaders at Cisco, we think about things around their, their global abilities, their global to local transformation. Um, from a critical skill standpoint, we really look at fluid and fluidity and agility. We look at people who can both drive results and at the same time uplift their team. And so it's a, it's a point where we are always having to look at what are we doing and how do we do it better? Because one of the critical parts to this that I see is continuing to focus on ourselves as leaders and not resting on kind of what's worked in the past. You, know, you mentioned that uh, it's a really fast moving market. There is a huge pace of change in our industry with technology in general, and it does require leaders that have a lot of agility to, to keep up with that change and drive that change. Yeah, so thanks for your insights. I mean, it's kind of like you know, changing the way we work, changing the work itself, and having technology um, evolving at the pace it is. So I think we're, we're kind of all in this together. Um, on the next slide, we're going to jump into our first trend. And the trend is companies hire for the work, not the job. And so I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, we talk about total talent. And when we say total talent, like what we refer to is looking at the spectrum of talent across an organization, full time, Employee, employees, part-time employees, contractors, statement of work professionals, freelancers, there's a pretty wide range of what makes up the workforce. And that dynamic is shifting, right? That dynamic is shifting. So we find um, more and more organizations we work with and we talk to are starting to look more holistically, um, HR and procurement across that spectrum of talent. 76% um, of companies that responded to this survey um, talked about the fact that they haven't yet adopted a total talent approach, but they plan to do so in the next 12 months. That's a pretty high percentage of organizations that are starting to look more holistically. And you talked about agility and building that agility within the recruiting space so that, you know, quality and speed and scalability can happen, putting the right talent in the right place at the right time. So, Kelly, how is Cisco evolving this global to local leadership in its talent management model? What are, what are you guys doing as you look across the talent landscape? 
So it's an interesting time for this question at Cisco because over the last year, we've actually evolved our go-to-market model to be a little bit more driven from the center in terms of strategy and relying on the local teams to do implementation. So that's really how we strike that balance. We try to have strategy driven centrally, but allow for the local teams to really customize. Given that we are in over 96 countries, there's a lot of differentiation around customs and laws, and so we really rely on the local teams to, to implement that strategy. But from a leadership standpoint, it's interesting because regardless of where you sit, what country, what function, we do have some things that are so deeply embedded into our culture that we ask of leaders that scale across all. Um, and it's a little bit about our transformation, and, and we've kind of made a conscious decision that we're getting there through the power of teams and through the power of great leaders. And so we ask all of our Cisco leaders, regardless of where they sit in the world, um, to kind of perform a dual role, to be great at uplifting performance, but also great at delivering results in the business. Um, so for us, we really look at it as kind of an all-in and, and the power of teams to really, really drive that. Mm -hmm. Kelly, are you seeing um, a shift in the configuration of full-time, part-time contractors? Or, or are you looking at different models as, as you set the, the global framework and the local execution? Yeah, we absolutely are. And when I was looking at your percentage, I was thinking, you yeah, know, that, that resonates with me. It's a conversation we're having as an enterprise. You know, the nature of work is changing. The nature of how people want to work is changing. If you look at some of the complexity we have, I mentioned earlier about how quickly things are moving, us having that agility to be able to harness not just the traditional way that we've hired in the past, but also look at how we do contractor services and how we do flexible working options that really fit the way that people want to work rather than just the way that we're used to hiring, it's a conversation that we've been having um, within our enterprise, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Not, not surprised to hear. I would bet most people on the phone are having similar conversations. I know we are with Advanced Side Source, right, for sure. Um, and we've done a, a fair amount of work looking at a kind of full-time and part-time and contingent model, uh, particularly in our, our RPO business where uh, we, we do a lot of that work, so um, I think it will continue to evolve as well. So thanks, thanks for the insights there. Yeah. Let's go on to um, the next slide, and we can talk a little bit about our second trend. Um, and, and this is an interesting one from my perspective. So access to niche or niche skills will determine the winners um, in the coming years. And so when you think about the jobs that we're trying to recruit for and we're trying to fill within our organizations, you think out about the jobs that are going to be in the future that we don't even know what they are yet, it kind of can be a daunting task, right? Um, I have a, an interesting statistic from Dell and the Institute for the Future, 85% um, of jobs that will exist in 2030 don't exist yet. So when you think about Kelly as the global leader of talent acquisition, um, how do you manage the current need and the future, building that work for the future, how do you wrestle with that need? Because it can be quite daunting. It, it is quite daunting, and, and I'll answer your Cisco question, and I, I'll also say that as a mother with a college student, that's a fascinating conversation to have about what is the degree that you pick. And uh, yeah. the conversation I have with my daughter, and it's kind of relevant to this answer as well, is the future is going to be won by those who have emotional agility, intellectual agility, and resilience. Um, it's very difficult to say that we used to be able to 30 years ago become a doctor, become an accountant, become an engineer, you'll have stability. Um, that's not the way the world works anymore. So one of the things I always push with my daughter is those three things. And I would say that pulls into Cisco a little bit too. So we're hiring people to come and join our ecosystem. And we're looking for lifelong learners. You know, the value creation, if you think about what we do in Cisco, I believe that value creation is, is HR's business. If someone were to ask me, what do you do in HR? I create value, you know, on a broad level. Because what we do is help leaders figure out these tough questions around niche skills, how they bring them in. Um, it's certainly a, a, a challenging issue for us. And we look for people who have agility. So when we interview, we also look for that in a personality trait. And we look for some of those skills that you can't really train on. 
you know, you can train people to use certain software products. You cannot train people on resilience. You, know, you cannot train people on quick. You know, those are some of the things that we tend to look for when we bring people into our strategy. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that from a value creation standpoint, that should be what we do in HR. Being able to deliver the right insights and the people analytics to help our leaders make the right decisions, but also be able to supply the information about not only where the talent is externally, but how we develop that talent internally to be able to meet those niche needs. Because I think the conversation about um, critical skills and niche skills oftentimes talks about how do we find those skills, but I also think it needs to be a strategy that is kind of working on all cylinders. So a big piece of that is also your employee development. Yeah, and that is a great, great point. You know, Tracy mentioned earlier, um, you know, I, I joke a little bit about this 80% of the goal of talent strategy is to drive value creation for the business. So what are the other 20%? What are they just <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, the, the question, and, and I don't expect you to have a fully baked answer because I know we wrestle with it as, as I'm sure the organizations and, and people on the phone do, but how are you thinking about measuring and communicating um, that quantifiable impact that you drive from a talent strategy standpoint? Yeah, that's a great question and it, because it's something that we actually talk a lot about in our HR ecosystem. Um, as you can imagine, we have a lot of traditional KPIs in terms of how we measure the operational effectiveness of our business. But the conversation that we're having right now is how do we actually attribute a dollar value or a, an impact value to that? And I would say it's a creative conversation that we're having right now. Um, it's a little bit about how do we look at performance on critical roles with our talent? Do we look at uh, the cost of vacancy mitigation and how do we bring that together in a way that really tells the story? So we're kind yeah. of, um, I would say, out there on the creative diving board a bit around how we do this. And for me, it's a story. Right now, I work in talent acquisition. I'm an HR professional mm -hmm. with huge talent acquisition experience, but I consider myself to be an HR professional. So when we think about business impact, for me, it is the business impact more broadly. How do we pull the data points together to be able to tell the story to our business leaders around what we're doing in the area of value creation? So I would say it's a conversation that we are having on a bit of an ongoing basis around how do we evolve our KPIs to really tell more of a business value story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, I know I wrestle with it um, as, as does, you know, our team. Um, we put a scorecard together at kind of the first step, and we're, we're looking at some metrics, but it will evolve, and I think we, we will get better, better over time. Um, around the pipeline for uh, finding those um, niche skills, anything that Cisco is doing, Kelly, around developing um, a current pipeline or creating talent pools or anything along those lines? Yeah, uh, outside of the traditional recruiting methods, which we certainly do, um, we are actually looking at this problem a little bit differently. And I, I feel personally that this is a time where the power of taking industry and nonprofits and governments and kind of working together around some of these solutions with the critical skill gap um, is very important and could be very, very powerful. Um, an example of that, something that we're doing last year at the World Economic Forum, our CEO, Chuck Robbins, and 10 other CEOs actually agreed to partner together on a skill portal called Skillset, which is essentially we are taking all of our internal tra uh, training library and open-sourcing it, you know, basically putting it into the skill set, which actually does two things. It allows people to search on jobs of the future and then give them a bit of a pathway around what are the critical skills that you need to develop in that job, and then connects them to that training. So anything from business acumen to network security infrastructure, you can go on and take a class. Um, and that's a little bit about building skills for Cisco, but also building skills for the world, because that's, as you can imagine, we don't limit that just to Cisco. There are some other things we do around this. If you look at our, we have a network academy at Cisco, that has been around a very long time. And network academy originated over 20 years ago with the focus of teaching networking skills around the globe. 
And I think they, I think I saw this yesterday on LinkedIn, they just hit 8 million students uh, that they've reached around the world. I think it's in like 180 different countries. It's a huge reach. They've been morphing that platform, and now it's focused on digitization and IoT, and it's a very low to no cost way to train, again, a Cisco workforce, but also just a workforce in general. So our network academy is something that we're really trying to do to, to reach deeply into the workforce. I mean, some of the front runners are building that global network. I think maybe one of the front runners is building that global network. Yeah. I think we were. Yeah. When I look back and see when people really started that, I think we were one of the first that said, this is also the right thing to do for the world rather than just the right thing to do for Cisco because it's the right thing for people. Yes. Yes. Some of those are creative. So is this open source um, information available broadly? High school yes. students, college students, yes, yeah, that's great. That's, that's very There's convenient. not an age requirement. Yeah, there's not a geographical requirement broadly available. So some of what I'm hearing, is, so some organizations are developing relationships at the high school level. And so, yes. yeah, this, this, this would be a, a nice tie to that as well. So very creative. We are doing yeah. that as well, actually. We just rolled that out about four years ago, five years ago, mm -hmm. high school internships. Mm -hmm because what we noticed was we have a very robust university hiring program, but what we realized was when you are at that level, you've already gone through people that have self-selected out of some of the science and math classes that you need to foundationally do some of the more higher level and higher level engineering roles. And so what the data actually tells us is that if you bring industry into a discussion in the classroom, whether it's a high school classroom, whether it's a college classroom, you have a lot more retention of students when you bring that industry perspective in. And I think some of it is it makes the job more tangible rather than just theoretical, I'm going to be a, a network engineer, I'm going to be a security engineer. Um, so we've actually gone into the high schools as well in some of our functions and really started talking to students about choosing this as a career. Hugely important work, particularly in the STEM realm. Thanks for that, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to our next trend, next slide. Um, this is all about the talent scarcity crisis, right? Um, and I mentioned talent communities um, a, a bit ago. 73% uh, of our respondents um, say that they're creating specific talent communities and content plans um, to engage that current and, and future um, talent and, and opportunities for future recruits. So, um, if you think about Cisco, Kelly, what are some of the greatest challenges that you face as you think about your talent strategy? Yeah, so, so I'll make a comment on this, this trend and then I'll answer that. We are doing the same thing around how do we develop and nurture individual talent communities um, because we found that it's essential. So it's a big move for us through our CRM. Um, in terms of challenges, I have to say the largest is probably just the pace of change both in our industry and with technology. It is, um, as you know, we're in the same industry, just an accelerated pace of change. And so it does require you to constantly sharpen the sword and, and be on front of what's happening in, in your industry. I would also say that the talent scarcity challenge is a big piece. The lack of proof of skills around some of the areas um, that, that we're looking for. I read an interesting statistic around this, and I hope I get this number right. I think it said, that it was like 78% of the jobs that were being uh, posted, you know, or being put out on LinkedIn, which was hugely a recruiter forum, as you know, were the same uh -huh. jobs. So it's the same company looking for the same skill set. So you have these niche skills narrowed down where everybody is kind of fishing in the same pool. So this idea of how do we both identify, and I mentioned earlier, develop some of these critical skills we need for the future. So definitely the, the supply of, of talent in these niche areas is uh, yeah. probably the second one I would say that, that's one of the risky ones. Sure. So, and you know, one of the stats that I read I think it was HR Magazine, one out of three students and graduates entering the workforce um, were part of the talent community so before they got to the job. And I would suspect that that number will continue, that ratio will continue to climb. Um, and the corollary of, of the what gets in the way, what are some of the enablers? What are some of the, the things that create momentum for you as you think about your um, your, your, your talent strategy and, and 
finding finding your your talent. Yeah, I like that question so much better. <laughs> the momentum <laughs> question. Started with that, actually. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Um, we're, we're in an interesting place right now where this is actually gaining a lot of uh, momentum through the transition that we're going through with our business. Um, I think one of the biggest things I would have to say is probably our software subscription sales. If you look at our Q2 earnings, I, I believe it was 55% of our software sales are now coming through recurring revenue. And that for us is just a, a symbol of the fact that our strategy is working. You know, we, Chuck became CEO four or five years ago, and we really started talking about transitioning our strategy to be more of an IT services company. And I do remember reading a lot of articles where people were, um, what's the word I'm looking for, not convinced it was going to work. And I was working within this ecosystem with 75,000 friends of mine to, to ensure that we made this work. And so now, as you start to see this shift, uh, what you're seeing is the composition of that revenue is starting to reflect what the strategy is working. So I feel like that's giving us a lot of momentum. But I would say that maybe even more so than that, one of the things that I think is, is really helping us is the culture. And culture is a hard, everyone talks about culture, but it's very difficult to explain the physical culture if you haven't, if you haven't lived in it. But I feel like it's giving us a lot of momentum because the work that we're doing in doubling down on teams and ensuring that we know what do the best and high performing teams look like? What are the habits of those teams? What are the habits of the leaders in those teams? You know, what do we know about the behaviors of both the leaders and the team members that will help us then take that and apply it to other areas of the organization to ensure that we're kind of meeting maximum performance? So certainly it's how we are doing in, in the market, how we are doing relative to our IT transition, but I also think more powerfully, it's the power of teams that we're really doubling down on and how that's affecting our organizational culture. Kelly, how do you assess for culture fit? You know, I have to say, there's a debate about culture fit, culture ad, and, and I want to push on that a little bit because you know, culture yeah. fit is kind of like, yeah, you're like us, you fit our culture, um, which we all know the data on diverse teams tells us that we don't need people that are all like us. You know, sometimes right. it's really good to have that naysayer in the room who might make you slightly uncomfortable because the approach is not your approach and the, the way they articulate it is not the way you articulate it, but manage well, you actually get to a better solution. So I really mm -hmm. think of this when we hire as culture fit and culture ad. When I think about what the culture is at Cisco, we are a high-performing organization that tends to attract people that want to do great things in the world. You know, there's a little bit of that when you come into Cisco. CSR is a huge element of who we are and how we show up. You know, there's that old best in the world, best for the world that is still our aspiration. And so those are the types of things that we do look for. But we try to be really careful in the culture fit word so that we're not just hiring people that look like everybody and sound like everybody that we have right now. So we look for That's a lot of different thinkers. Absolutely fantastic to me. And Mike still looks seamlessly instead of culture fit, culture ad. I love it. I love it. All right, let's go on to the next trend. And um, this one is about technology, which we talked a little bit about, and analytics. Um, particularly as it relates to diversity and inclusion, which is a great segue into what you were just talking about. So 45% um, of organizations say they conduct diversity training to minimize unconscious bias. So in addition to having a strategy, which many of the respondents say they, they do, um, what is Cisco doing, Kelly, um, to advance its diversity and inclusion goals? And are you using any technologies to um, try to reduce that unconscious bias? Yes, we do have uh, some technologies embedded in all parts of the process to reduce some of that bias. Um, we're in that 45% you referenced. We do unconscious bias training, but we also yes. focus on other areas of the funnel. We have a, a product that works with our job descriptions to start at the very top end and scrub bias out of the language that we use because we know that certain words tend to be more alienating to certain populations. And so this is an interesting AI product that actually learns every time you use it, every time you run a job description through it, it comes back and, and gives you recommendations of how to change that language to increase the diversity on the top of your funnel. We are also looking at how we do diverse interview panels. External data tells us that the more diverse your panel is, the higher likelihood you're going to hire a diverse candidate. So we're really focusing on that as well. 
But what I would say in the diversity and inclusion goal, the conversation we're actually having right now is not so much about diversity and inclusion on an enterprise level, but it's about belonging. And if you think about diversity as like a road, diversity is never a goal. It's a road that gets you to kind of that first rest stop, which is inclusion. And inclusion mm -hmm. is we're including everyone, and that's great. But belonging is everybody feels like they're contributing in the ecosystem. And when we think about how we're evolving our culture and this concept of conscious culture, what we're talking a lot about, it really does get more to the idea of belonging. You know, that is what we're aspiring for right now within, within the ecosystem. Great. Thank you for that. Let's go on to the next trend, um, trend number five. Short-term relationships with talent hold employers back. So this gets to the need to engage before and during and throughout the life cycle of a recruit and a hire, right? Um, having that relationship, forging that relationship, and um, having touch points and transparency um, with, with recruits and, and hires um, throughout, throughout the, the cycle and the, and the system. 58% um, of talent who had a positive talent experience would recommend their employer to others, right? So um, is that long-term relationship building a focus for Cisco? And if so, what are some of the things that you're doing to foster relationships with your, your recruits and your talent? Yeah, it definitely is because I would say if that data point was percent of talent who had a negative experience who would talk about it, that number's probably 98. <laughs> so without a doubt, <laughs> well, the long-term yeah. engagement is, is really critical. Yeah, it's really critical for us. And, and our data tells us that sometimes when we engage with a candidate for the first time and look at them for a role, uh, they might not be hired for the first role. They might be hired for the second role. They might come on through our vendor program. So we don't adhere to the concept of disposable candidates. We think it's critical to nurture those talent communities. And one of the ways that we're doing this is through um, a talent network that we have that lives within our CRM that we're developing that really focuses on that exact thing. How do we ensure that people who have an interest in us we continue to communicate with them through various channels around what, what is happening at Cisco and keep that talent community warm. Um, the challenge with what we do is we're trying to line up the timing, the financial alignment of timing and open requisition with great people. And at the end of the day, the role of the talent or acquisition organization is to find great people and bring them in. And sometimes you have a great person at the time in which you do not have a funded requisition. And so we focus very strongly on keeping those talent communities warm so that when the cycle on the other side hits, we are able to bring that candidate in. We also find at that point they've already engaged with us to the point where there's more of a comfort level. You know, we've had a bit of an ongoing relationship, so they're not starting from scratch with us. And so there's a, it, it makes the process a little bit more seamless because then it just becomes about what is the role, not so much who is Cisco, because we've introduced this to them um, for a pretty long time prior to the engagement. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like you do a lot of um, us talking work around your brand. Yes, uh, we do. Yeah. We do. And it's something we made a conscious decision on um, several years ago. And one of the powerful ways I think that we do this, Cindy, is that we allow our employees to be the voice of the brand in many ways. You know, we have a social branding team that focuses on our employer, uh, employee brand, but it's not, you know, me sitting in the background talking about how great Cisco is. I do talk about how great Cisco is because I think it is. But we turn our um, our social handles over to our employees. And Snapchat's a great example of that. We'll give our Snapchat handle to an engineer who's sitting in Mumbai and they get to talk about the day. And so, you know, we try to bring the voice of the employee, which is authentically what our culture is, into those interactions. That's great. That's really nice. It, it, brought, it broadens the reach, I would think, with yeah. multiple perspectives, for sure. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so many good ideas, Kelly, and we're only on five. <laughs> so well, let's go to the next trend, um, the next slide. Um, so this one is of interest. So for many, many years, as I'm sure most people on the phone know, and you know Kelly for sure, as do I, you know, HR wants a seat at the table, right? And the, the, that, that conversation is, is over because I think, um, you know, the, the need for talent and the talent scarcity issues that we're talking about clearly 
has HR front and center to helping organizations drive um, drive the business forward. So uh, this talent um, insight is that the role of the CHO is on the rise to be that of uh, the CEO's right-hand person or, to, or advisor, right? 83% um, of human capital leaders who surveyed said that the goal is to have a measurable impact on the business, as, as we talked about. So um, you can do that through numerous ways, and one way is to use data and to use data effectively um, to inform about workforce, about workforce planning, about geographies and, and, and future business um, expansion goals. What is Cisco doing um, around getting data into the hands of business leaders so that they can plan for their um, workforce building? Yeah. That, that's a huge part of what we do, and, and I will, will say before we go too deeply into this, again, this is one of those where it should be 100%, and uh, I, feel, I feel very fortunate. Yeah. I feel very fortunate in that um, we are in that model at Cisco right now. So we have a chief people officer who actually is um, very influential around the business strategy, and we're fortunate to have a CEO that, that actually understands how much organizational culture and the health of that and our people strategy impacts results. So I think we've actually done an exceptional job telling that story at the executive level um, because we have that area of influence. But to answer the question, I think that there's a couple areas around that. One of the things that we really focus on amongst the team I'm in right now is we have an internal talent training division whose job it is is to essentially help us figure out where is our talent moving, where they're coming from, where they're going to, by grade level, by location, um, where are our competitors up in sites, where it might affect a retention area for us, and how do we bring all those data points together to tell a story. Um, our job in HR is to really kind of take the entire you know, the talent cloud, all of the data that exists out there about our people. We have all these distinct data points about people and pull them together in a story that tells impact on how we influence the strategy. And one way we're doing that, which is um, really kind of cool in my mind, is we have this, uh, we're piloting this, so I'll share this with you as like an early uh, preview. We're doing something that is essentially an organizational network analysis, but we're calling it the human network analysis. And what it is, um, it is basically a way that we map within Cisco. Uh, think of it this way. We gather data about how everyone works, who is in their network, who are they WebEx teaming with, you know, who they work through to accomplish their critical tasks and outcomes, and mapping that to what a best team looks like so that we can circle mm -hmm. back to our leaders and say, these are the, if you are, I'm, I'm going to make this up, if you're an account manager and I'm sitting in the U.S., these are the critical contact points for you to, or in order to be really successful in your role. So we're mapping how the organization interacts and networks with each other to be able to come back and give that level of insight. And right now it's HR, IT, sales, and I think maybe employee services, so I'm in this as well. Um, and it's a chart, it's a very strange looking chart with dots that shows how everybody connects, but that strange looking chart with dots actually provides some pretty amazing insights about how we drive our strategy forward. Okay, so do you have dedicated data teams telling within your different groups? How do you how do you structure yeah. that? We do have dedicated data teams within our within our various groups. We look for synergy when it when it's at all possible about how they overlay. But if I just take for example the organization I'm working in now in talent acquisition, our talent trend, trend team um, is specific to talent acquisition, but it actually works more broadly. They work more broadly across the business and with our awesome strategy and planning to help make decisions around uh, website strategy and different uh, approaches that we're taking in different markets. So yes, we do we do have those intact teams within various functions. Yeah, excellent. There's so much so much around data to insights. Um, and I know with moving around that first we're working hard to move that and to to invest and to get that right. And um, your human network analysis pilot that you talked about is a great example of driving insights from data. So thanks for that sneak peek. All right, so let's go to number seven. Talent trend number seven. HR goes on a tech buying spree to get better access to talent. And so all the emerging technologies, right, 92% um, of those we spoke with um, affirm that, you know, technology enhances, obviously, attraction, attraction engagement, retention, 
of talent. You know, that was 79% just two years ago, so that has, lot, has risen to a pretty high number. Um, how do you determine, how does Cisco determine where you pick your spot? Where you invest, how you measure, you know, the value that you're getting out of uh, that technology, and how, how do you keep pace and how do you work with adoption? So I asked you about 19 questions on that one, but talk a little bit about decisions and adoption. All right, I'll see, I'll see if I can unpack and get to at least the 18 of the questions in, in the question. Um, I think to start, the first thing that we really focus on is, is clarity around what is the problem that we're trying to solve and what is the impact that we're trying to drive. Um, there are so many shiny things out there in HR tech right now. You know, navigating, there are hundreds of vendors doing some version of AI that each kind of plug in at different places. And so for us, it's a little bit about having a firm understanding about what is the outcome that we're trying to drive and be really, really clear on what our problem statement is and not get distracted by some of the shiny things. Um, we also look at, is it a transformational technology or is it something that is enhancing a process? You know, and does it in fact hit a need for us or does it just hit a tool factor that doesn't actually solve the problem? Um, one mm -hmm. other thing that we really look at with our HR tech investment, and I don't know that it's unique. I think that others look at this as well. But we look at how, we start to say there, and how does it impact, impact the employee culture? You know, we look at how does it impact the social and emotional behavior of our employees because it's important to us and it affects how well we're going to be able to adopt the technology. So, so we tend to also look at that when we're making decisions. Um, the largest part of the decision is, is how is it going to positively affect our customers, our employees, and our potential candidates. And so we tend to, the, the big project we have going on right now is really around centralizing their data hub. And that is a bit about how do you drive predictive, and predictive data? How are you able to take some of the stuff that we're pulling through the organizational health network and really impact business results to align to the people strategy? So for us, at the end of the day, it comes down to doing the most good for the most aligned to the strategy that, that we're trying to drive. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you have a pretty strategic framework on how you do your analysis yeah. with driving that yeah. clarity on the business problem. Yeah, that's a great, great explanation. Thank you for that, Kelly. Um, let's go to the next slide and we can talk about trend number eight. And um, this is about analytics and you've given us some great stories and insights on what Cisco is doing. 83% um, say ta talent analytics play a critical role in sourcing, attracting, engaging, and retaining talent. Um, what investments are you making around talent an an analytics? You talked a little bit about your team construct and what impact is this making in the business? Yeah, so a couple things. On a high level, our focus is really on digitizing the experience. And I mentioned um, previously around this concept of how do we take all of these things in the talent cloud that we have, all of these various people analytics, and have them in a centralized data hub that allows us to drive these deep insights. That is the big investment that we have going on right now that gets to predictive analytics. But I would also say that over the last year, we've made a pretty significant investment in a new ATS that has more robust capabilities than what we've seen in the past. And that investment was a direct result of some of the things we spoke of earlier around scarcity of talent, ability to manage passively our talent networks, ways we can mobile and on-demand our website. So it really got to a lot of um, those types of things. In the TA space specifically, in talent acquisition, we look at things that help recruiters focus on being able to talk to candidates and reducing some of the administrative pieces around it. The HR space more broadly, we really, we really look at what are the investments that are going to drive the level of insights that we need, and it's largely around our, our data hub that maybe told me it's going on. But I will say there's one other thing that we're doing that I think is driving a powerful impact, and that is how we're using our um, what we call our diversity talent accelerators. This is a tool suite. We call them CTAs. This is a tool suite that um, actually was provided by our Office of Inclusion and Collaboration, and it's a whole set of analytics around how we are attracting and engaging diverse talent at Cisco. And so we partner with them closely on some of the things I mentioned earlier around pipeline starting with mm -hmm. um, Textio, how we bring candidates into Cisco, but then there's also a whole part around that that is about uh, how we use data around what our workforce looks like right now, where the areas mm -hmm. of opportunity are for us, 
where the areas of opportunity are in the market and how we can kind of bring in diverse engineering panels in a digitized way into the process of, of the recruiting organization. So analytics is a huge push for us, as you can imagine, because we actually also build products that help customers make those decisions, and it's a big part of how we work in our HR ecosystem. So you actually put it into practice. So you, you can use yourself as a, as a use case, right? Yes. No, that's great. That's good. Um, thanks for some of those examples, Kelly. Um, the next trend, trend number nine, um, is about robotics. And robotics still chronic job vacancies. Um, 83% seems to be a, a, a common number in some of, us, some of our trends. I believe robotics have a uh, a lot of influence on the business and will continue to. Um, and, you know, there, there are some schools of thought, some you know, dual minds on robotics and the fear that it instills sometimes in individual employees and the workforce and the opportunity that it can create, particularly with the talent scarcity that we've talked about. And you think you know, Japan is an example, right? With their union workforce and the extreme talent scarcity they have, they really have no choice but to look at robotics. And you know, we can go go across the globe, and we can go into different industries, and and we can probably sing that same song. So, what are you doing in Cisco around robotics and AI, um, and how has that helped to accelerate the Cisco performance? It's such a great discussion topic, and if my husband were here, he would tell you how many rabbit holes I've gone down on Saturday morning reading articles about this. I think those of us that work in talent are fascinated by this because there there are a couple schools of thought around this, and I personally am not afraid of the robot army. I think if anything else, um, history tells us that as technology advances and automation advances, certain jobs are eliminated, but, but typically more jobs end up being created post that elimination. And so I'm not afraid of uh, the robot yeah. army. History has kind of brought out repeatedly that, you know, jobs will be there. We, we do, and, and this isn't so much a Cisco statement as more of a human statement, it is going to require all of us to ensure that we adopt the lifelong learner mindset. You know, it's going to require all of us, and it goes back to that emotional and intellectual agility. We're all going to have to be able to figure this out. And the, and the future around this that I see, and that I'm saying at Cisco, is more about how do we work with this technology. And so that that's yeah. really what we're focused on. And when I think about the areas that we are kind of currently looking at AI and looking at robotics, a lot of it is around the tasks that are um, routine or repetitive, be they intellectual or physical. You know, those are the types of tasks that are very easily automated. And AI is really, really good at these types of tasks. Um, the supply chain manufacturing area is an area that happens. But we also have elements of AI in our job as recruiters. AI is one of those things that exists in many places, and sometimes you don't even notice that it's there because you're working with it. It's not a robot army that's taken over your job. And a great example of that is actually um, that something Cisco, we all live in WebEx teams at Cisco. And Cisco is actually rolling something really interesting out in WebEx teams that is AI called, and this is not a product pitch, but I think it's fascinating, so I have to talk about it. It's called Cognitive Collaboration. And essentially what it is, um, when you join a WebEx team drum, what will happen is it will say, hi, Cindy, I see that it looks like you have a meeting with Kelly later on today. It's Kelly Jones. Would you like to join that meeting now? And you can say, uh, no, I need to fix my hair or I need to get a coffee or whatever it is if you choose not to. Or uh, you can say, yes, join that meeting in four minutes. And then what the system will actually do, even if it's not sure who the Kelly is, it goes through your contacts and your network to and makes the guess to say, it's Kelly Jones. That has to be the person you're having this meeting with based on all that we know about you. And then it will pop up my picture, who I am, and an external swipe around uh, my LinkedIn profile. If I've done any webinars recently, what you need to know about me. And as a fiscal employee, I am wildly excited about this piece of AI because I very often walked into a meeting that was put on my calendar four weeks ago, and I can't remember what it's about or what they wanted or who they even are. You know, you join meetings. Sometimes you go meeting to meeting. So I, I hit the start button. I'm like, who is this Bob person? And at the bottom, it will tell me, this is Bob. This is what he does. And it will pull his child profile into the meeting. And so that type of AI, when you think about what that does, it uplifts the performance of your organization. No, that is not a detriment. 
That sounds absolutely fascinating, actually. And, and so Amy Chang is doing a webinar tomorrow if anyone is interested. That, that's great. Have you piloted that internally? Is that ready to? Yes, not me personally. It's something that Cisco has looked at. I uh, unfortunately was not in the pilot for that, but I will be one of those people. I think it was feedback that we actually got from customers that developed that part of the product, and, and I'm one of the people that, when I saw it, thought, that's neat for me. So I'm excited about mm -hmm. it, but I wasn't in the pilot. Yeah, that, that, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. But, but your point is spot on from my perspective about there will always be jobs, and it's up to us to continue to learn and to be open to upskilling and reskilling ourselves. Right. So great point on that one. All right, let's close it out with trend number 10 and then we'll um, take some, some Q&A. So um, this last one is, um, it's an interesting one, right? And it's, it's, it's not overly alarming, but candidates, employees, recruits, right? They're tech savvy and they're customers and they expect the same experience from their employers. Right. So the the expectation level of employers of employees and employees of employers is rising. Right. Sixty sixty one percent of professionals say that they're they're expecting more of their employers. And and the, the number is even higher. It's about eighty eighty three percent I think of employers are expecting more of their employees. So what are you doing to understand the rising needs of your talent? And how are you expecting what the future talent will need as you're thinking about all of this um, expectation setting and delivery? Yeah. We do spend time trying to understand what's happening from an external trend standpoint, for sure. But I have to say the most mm -hmm. powerful thing that I think that we do around this is honestly listening to our people. And if you think about some of the big things that we've done over the last few years, then they must all come from our employees. You know, Cisco is at a bit of an inflection point where we are moving towards this concept of employee-led culture. So we have within Cisco something we call the people deal. And the people deal is essentially what we expect from our employees and what they can expect from us in return. It's a very simplistic framework that was developed not within HR. It was kind of shepherded through the process by HR, but developed by employees in Europe. And it was very simply from a conversation that they started having around, this is what we would like to know, <laughs> and this is what we would like to tell you. So our entire um, I, I thought talent strategy framework was developed from our employees. Um, we also, some other interesting things we've done, uh, birthday day off, which sounds very simplistic. Uh, one of our team members was having a conversation with a leader and had a question about, motivation, you know, how, what motivates them, and they said something along the lines of, it would be really cool to have my birthday off. And if you think about, like, what a little thing that is, and so, you know, very quickly we kind of said, ah, we can do that, pretty easy, let's, let's keep our employees engaged. So, we're just there, you get your birthday off now. Uh, the all on the weekend, you take them on New York Friday, um, but trying to give us the same. We just five days paid time to go and volunteer at charity. That came from employees. So when we look at how we evolve what it is that we offer to our talent, the majority of that is coming from what our employers are telling us. And I think because we've done so many of the things that they've brought to us, they know that they're going to be listened to. So there is no shortage of feedback around some of the things that they'd like to see. And I think the future is a little bit about that and also about understanding some of the generational differences and making sure that we have a multi-generational approach um, that, that never gets um, lazy or never gets arrogant around what it is we're doing. For me, I think that's really important to avoid, avoid laziness and arrogance when it comes to what you're offering. A really nice, nice way to end this part of what we're doing um, is to hear about every voice is heard and that you adopt policy around um, the recommendations and suggestions of your employee base. That's, that's fantastic. So thank you. You walked us through and attend uh, trends and brought them to life with your concrete and specific examples um, and got me thinking a lot about a few things as well. And um, that's always a good thing from, from my perspective. And I think Probably everybody on the call uh, could say the same thing. So, uh, fantastic, Kelly. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it back to Tracy, who I think is going to moderate the next um, few minutes for questions. Yes, and uh, basically.
upon the number of questions we got, Kelly, you certainly did generate a lot of interest in questions and questions and probably a bit of envy as well, given the progressive things you and your team are doing. Um, and Cindy hopefully isn't too jealous, but <laughs> we will um, go ahead and, and start with some of the questions um, that have come in. And let me start here at the top. Um, is there any specific example, Kelly, where you've created a linkage between KPIs on human capital and maybe KPIs for the business? And do you relate that to any of the roles within your organization? So in other words, you know, how might a particular business leader, their role impact you know, the growth of the business, but also human capital-related objectives. Is there any example you might have within the Cisco organization that could speak to that? Probably the best example that I can think of is, is TeamSpace. And TeamSpace is a tool that we use that measures um, engagement, but also gives our leaders a framework in which to communicate with their employees about what their largest priorities are, or help them even getting those priorities done, um, as well as what they're, what they're focusing on for the next week, and are they using their strengths. And the way that we are using team space, so we have an individual ask around that where there is a, we ask employees to check in and talk about these things. We ask leaders to make sure they're having frequent conversations with their employees and also to do um, performance snapshots of how, how are their employees doing. Five questions, easy questions. It's not a traditional performance management system. Um, we ask our, our leaders to do that as well as engagement pulses. And you can see a correlation. If you, if you think about like individual KPIs and what we're asking people to do in business performance, you do start to see a correlation between people who are using their strengths every day and feel like they're contributing great value to people who are driving impact and driving the right types of results. So our team space platform is a really interesting way uh, in which we kind of bring those two things together, I think, and actually can have an impact story around productivity of the employee. That's a terrific way to really correlate the focus on the business, the priorities that you described, and making everybody accountable for that engagement and, and how you advance the mission of your people and, and the company simultaneously. Um, there was a question, I think, um, one about the AI product you were mentioning. Someone wanted to know if you could mention the name of that tool, if that was relevant, or we certainly can follow up and share that information. Kelly, is that something you're at liberty to mention? Sure. So, so I mentioned two. I'm going to assume they were talking about the cognitive collaboration tool. So the cognitive collaboration tool is the AI product coming out within WebEx meetings, and there's actually a webinar. Amy Chang, who leads our collaboration portfolio for Cisco, is having a webinar on the same time tomorrow. I'm not exactly sure what time. But that's called cognitive collaboration, and that's the tool that actually brings content and intelligence into your meeting. Um, the other AI tool I mentioned, just in case this is the question, was Textio. And Textio is the AI tool that scrubs the bias out of the job description. Yeah. Well, thank you. That is um, a great update. We have other questions that perhaps we'll send to you offline and follow with. But uh, thank you again, Kelly. Thank you again, Cindy. Highly productive webinar. And uh, so appreciate your time today and for all the folks who joined us. And as discussed, we will sh share a recorded link um, to today's session if you'd like to listen to any of the content again or to share with your colleagues. Thanks again, and look forward to seeing you at our next webinar in June, which we'll be, we will be sharing details on here shortly. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.